Hoy, 16 de febrero del 2021, le damos, les damos la más cordial bienvenida a toda la audiencia que nos sintoniza en tiempo real y a la que nos sigue en otro momento. También les damos la más cordial bienvenida a la serie de seminarios del Instituto de Biología. Antes de, com de comenzar, quiero comunicarles que ya tenemos en puerta la nueve, nueva serie de seminarios Fronteras en Sistemática, Biodiversidad y Evolución 2021 los cuales son parte de una iniciativa de la dirección del Instituto para fortalecer las actividades de divulgación, difusión y vinculación en el Instituto de Biología de la UNAM. Esta serie de seminarios contará con ponentes líderes en investigaciones teóricas y empíricas en el estudio de la biodiversidad y los procesos que la determinan. Como podrán ver, tendremos uno de estos seminarios aproximadamente una vez al mes en el horario habitual y canal de seminarios del Instituto de Biología. Les solicitamos amablemente que nos apoyen eh, en darle difusión a esta serie de eventos para que tengan el mayor impacto en sus respectivas áreas académicas. La próxima semana arrancaremos con el seminario de la doctora Rebeca Zafran. Eh, sí, arrancaremos la próxima semana con el seminario de la profesora Rebeca Zafran de la Universidad de Colorado en Boulder. Quiero recordarles que, por única ocasión, para acomodarnos a la agenda de la doctora Zafran, su seminario será el día lunes en lugar de martes a las 11 am. Repito, por única ocasión, el seminario de la próxima semana será en lunes a las 11 am en lugar de nuestros habituales martes a las 11 am. Así que los esperamos el próximo lunes para iniciar esta serie de seminarios Fronteras en Sistemática, Biodiversidad y Evolución. Volviendo al seminario del día de hoy, les solicitamos amablemente que se registren en el canal de YouTube para entonces poder interactuar en el chat y les solicitamos que nos dejen su nombre, su procedencia, su nivel académico y es a través de este chat que vamos a recibir sus comentarios y preguntas para el expositor del día de hoy. Así que, sin más, le voy a ceder la palabra al doctor, eh, al maestro Emilio Petrone, eh, quien es estudiante de doctorado del posgrado en Ciencias Biológicas de nuestra institución y actualmente realiza su proyecto doctoral con el doctor Mark Olson. Quiero mencionar que el maestro en Ciencias Emilio Petrone se me acercó para solicitar ser anfitrión, puesto que se había puesto en contacto con el doctor Roshinkevitz un líder internacional y fundador del campo de la biología sintética y computacional. Lo anterior pues me dio mucho gusto, pues es a través de nuestros estudiantes que se están involucrando en enriquecer la vida académica de nuestra institución. Invito de esta forma que otros estudiantes se involucren de manera similar en futuras ocasiones. Pero pues eh, sin más por el momento, le cedo la palabra al, doctor, al maestro en ciencias Emilio Petrone para que presente a nuestro conferencista del día de hoy. Adelante, Emilio. Muchas gracias, Ulises. Eh, buenos días a toda la comunidad del Instituto de Biología. Es para mí un gran gusto presentar al doctor Prusinkiewicz, quien se une desde Calgary, Canadá, para dar el seminario del día de hoy. A continuación, les voy a dar una breve semblanza de nuestro invitado. El doctor Prusinkiewicz realizó su maestría y doctorado en Ciencias de la Computación en la Universidad Técnica de Varsovia, en Polonia. Trabajó como asistente en la Universidad de Ciencia y Tecnología en Argelia, en la Universidad de Regina en Canadá, y desde 1991 es profesor en el Departamento de Ciencias de la Computación de la Universidad de Calgary. El, doc el doctor Prusinkiewicz tiene numerosas distinciones académicas. Por mencionar algunas, es doctor honoris causa por la Universidad de East Anglia del Reino Unido y es miembro de la, miembro de la Sociedad Real de Canadá desde el 2014. La investigación del doctor Prusinkiewicz se enfoca en utilizar nociones y métodos de la ciencia de la computación aplicadas al desarrollo de plantas, desde la creación de software para el modelaje, simulación y visualización del desarrollo, hasta la síntesis de imágenes de plantas con fines de gráficas de cómputo como animaciones. Tiene más de 160 publicaciones y 20.000 citas, eh, y el trabajo del doctor ha sido un puente entre distintas áreas de investigación como la botánica y las ciencias de la computación. Además, tiene un gran compromiso con la formación académica, ha dirigido 18 tesis de doctorado y más de 40 tesis de maestría, y en su página de 
de Algorithmic Botany, eh, se pueden encontrar su trabajo, así como el software que ha desarrollado. Entonces, sin más, le cedo la palabra a nuestro invitado. And please, uh, Professor Prisinkiewicz, whenever you want to start. At the center of the head, there are disc florets. Mm -hmm. At the periphery, there are ray florets. Okay. So, yes. So, <laughs> so um, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, for uh, the nice introduction, Emilio. Uh, I could understand everything <laughs> since I can understand Spanish sufficiently. Unfortunately, I, can, I cannot speak, but muchas gracias. <laughs> um, I would prepare today's presentation in a little bit uh, different way than most presentations go. And this is to a large extent due to COVID. I um, we have to make this uh, seminar uh, via uh, the internet rather than uh, in person, which is not the same uh, kind of contact as it would be otherwise. So I prepared in such a way that um, I would like to first play a, a pre-recorded presentation, which is going to uh, last about 25 minutes, and in which I try to very clearly I hope you will, you will agree. I try to, to clearly lay, lay out uh, the, the issue and our um, new results. And, and then if I would be very much uh, open to your questions and I hope that you will have many. So if this is okay, let me start now the, the presentation itself. The work I will present was carried out in collaboration with Professor Paula Eloma and her group at the University of Helsinki. The topic of my presentation is the phyllotaxis in the aster family of plants. A distinctive feature of this family is that individual flowers are organized into heads. At the center of a head, there are disc florets. At the periphery, there are ray florets. And the entire structure is surrounded by bracts. As we zoom in, we can clearly see that the florets are organized into spirals, which are also called parastichis. For example, this head has 21 right winding parastichis and 34 left-winding parastichis. The arrangement of plant organs into spirals has fascinated scientists for centuries. Leonardo da Vinci is credited for being the first one who noticed the spirals. And Kepler was the first to notice that the spirals often occur in consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So, what are the Fibonacci numbers? We obtain them as follows. We start with 1 and 2, and then keep adding the last two numbers in the sequence together. So, 1 and 2 is 3. 2 and 3 makes 5. 3 and 5 is 8. 5 and 8 is 13, and so on. 21. 34, 55, 89. This leads us to the problem position. How do plants create patterns with Fibonacci numbers of spirals? Almost all existing explanations refer to the seminal hypothesis formulated 150 years ago by Hofmeister. He proposed that each new organ is initiated wherever there is enough room for it at the rim of the growing apex. Later on, Robert and Mary Snow added that a new organ emerges as soon as there is enough space for it. Here is a simulation example. The meristem is shown in brown, the initial primordium is white, and the apex is shown in red. 
as Zimmeristem grows, new primordia are added where and when there is enough space for them. In this case, the emerging structure has three parastiches winding one way and five winding another way. If we let the primordia grow into the actual organs, we can model entire plants this way. For example, this is a model of canola. Arabidopsis grows the same way. A feature of this scheme is that new primordia emerge near the center of the meristem and move away as the meristem grows. This is shown schematically in this animation. However, if you look at the typical flower head, you observe a big empty space in the center. This pattern is formed not from the inside out, but from the outside in. This is shown schematically here. And this is our open question. How do plants create Fibonacci numbers of spirals from the outside in? This process is puzzling because on the surface, it seems that it violates some principle of locality of interactions. To answer this question, we focused on Gerbera, which turned out to be quite conducive to genetic manipulation. Also, the Gerbera head is separated from the rosette by a long leafless stem, which suggests that it may be possible to consider each head in isolation. But how real this isolation actually is? In particular, may it be so that some phyllotactic information is carried from the rosette leaves to the head through the vascular system in the stem? To see whether this may be the case, we scanned several heads using X-ray microcomputed tomography. By digitally removing some bracts, we exposed the first family of veins. They are positioned in the lower part of the head and run radially from the stem towards the rim of the head. By virtually dissecting the head further, we observed a second family of veins, shown here in red. These are the veins that supply the majority of florets. As you can see, both families of veins run radially. They divide the head into sectors with no relation to parastiches. Moreover, on a small scale, they are quite chaotic. By putting these facts together, we concluded that the vasculature cannot be the factor that drives phyllotaxis in the Gerbera heads. And so, we focused on the hypothesis that the philotactic pattern in Gerbera heads develops de novo, from scratch in each individual head. To understand how this may happen, we first obtained SEMs of heads at different stages of development. As expected, at the later stages, shown at the bottom of the slide, the pattern progresses from the outside in. What was more interesting is that earlier on, the pattern was developing in an almost linear fashion at the rim of the growing head. And what was even more striking is that the first 13, or sometimes eight primordia, appeared to emerge at once, not sequentially, as is the case in Arabidopsis, for example. We then wondered whether we see indeed the earliest stages of patterning. In Arabidopsis and tomato, new primordia are patterned by maxima of oxygen concentration. So we suspected that this may be the case in Gerbera as well. To check it, we used a transgenic Gerbera with a DR5 Venus oxygen reporter. We observed 
that a pattern of auxin maxima emerges well before any morphological changes in the head occur. In other words, there is a pattern of auxin maxima before any bumps on the meristem surface. It would have been lovely to obtain a long time-lapse sequence of auxin patterning in a developing head, but we were not able to achieve this. Instead, we obtained confocal images of 55 random heads with up to 34 auxin maxima. There were two interesting observations we could make. First, although the heads were sampled at random, the distribution of the primordial numbers was highly non-uniform, with a preference for Fibonacci numbers. This indicated that the primordia and Gerbera are initiated at bursts, jumping from one Fibonacci number to another. Second, the heads with the same number of primordia could be superimposed. This indicated that the development of heads in Gerbera is highly stereotypical, and we can reconstruct it by putting images of different heads together in a sequence. There is also a small caveat here. The heads have two different chiralities, so to maximize the use of our data, we had to reflect some of them so that their chiralities match. In this slide, the reflected heads are pointed to by arrows. So now we have a new problem to solve. How can a plant produce Fibonacci numbers of primordia in bursts? This is a very different situation from that observed in Arabidopsis or tomato, where primordia are produced sequentially and rhythmically. A seminal idea came from an almost 100-year-old paper by Max Hirmer, who noticed that if primordia were arranged into a ring and the divergence angle between consecutive primordia was 137.5 degrees, or the golden angle, then exactly a Fibonacci number of primordia would fit without overlaps. And this was true for any constant primordia size. So, if the ring grew, the number of primordia that would fit would increase through a sequence of Fibonacci numbers. Intrigued by this observation, we wondered whether the pattern of gaps between primordia described by Hirmer can also be found in the Gerbera heads. So let's see. Here we consider superimposed DR5 Venus images of heads with eight incipient primordia. We estimated the position of the head center and the radial position of each auxin maximum. And then we drew primordia as circles of constant size. At first, the correspondence with Hilmer's drawing was not obvious. However, after we reflected and rotated Hilmer's image, it was bingo, a perfect match. Unfortunately, Hilmer's model is not mechanistic. It assumes the golden divergence angle out of the blue. So the next question was whether we can get rid of this assumption. To answer it, we focused on the pattern of primordial distribution on the rim. For a head with a single primordium, there was not much to say. For the second head, we identified the first primordium and then wrote down the pattern of gaps as we go around the head counterclockwise. So the first gap was short and the second was long, an S and an L. Incidentally, already this pattern is inconsistent with the standard Hofmeister's model, which predicts that the second primordium should be exactly opposite the first one. For three primordia, we obtain LLS. Then for five primordia, SLS, LL. And so on. For eight primordia, 13 primordia, and 21 primordia. If we put these results together, 
we see the following progression of gap patterns. So the question now is whether there is some general principle behind it. It turns out that there is, and the insight came from quite an unexpected direction. In 1972, Mitchison and Wilcox published a paper in which they described the development of a filament of the cyanobacterium anabena. They observed that so-called vegetative cells divide asymmetrically and the shorter cell is always on the side of its older neighbor. This pattern was subsequently formalized by Aristide Lindenmeyer as a set of rules or productions called an L system. The cells represented by symbols L and S now have polarities which point to their older neighbors. Depending on its polarity, a long cell divides into a long cell followed by a short one or a short cell followed by a long one. Meanwhile, a short cell grows to eventually become a long cell with the same polarity. Here is a simulation of this process. It turns out that as the filament grows, the generated sequence of short and long anabena cells is exactly the same as the sequence of short and long gaps between auxin maxima observed in the Gerbera meristem. A key element of this process is the asymmetric insertion of a new primordium into the gap between its neighbors. To investigate it, we obtained time-lapse images of five heads as they were developing around the 34 primordium stage. This was the earliest stage for which we succeeded with the time-lapse. We observed that each incipient maximum of the R5 expression emerges approximately halfway between the neighboring maxima, but then travels towards the other neighbor as the head grows. So this is how the asymmetry arises. With this information in hand, we constructed a computational model of early primordial patterning. As postulated by Hirmer, the model operates on a growing active ring. New primordia are inserted as soon as the space becomes available for them and then tend towards the older neighbor. For a comparison, we overlay the simulation on a sequence of confocal images of real heads in the background. So here is how it goes. As you can see, the simulation does reproduce the observed progression of patterns. At this point, we have a pattern of primordia on the rim, jumping from one Fibonacci number to the next. But we don't have parastichies yet. So, how do they emerge? To address this question, we consider the position of the active ring on the growing head in reality. We hypothesized that, as in Arabidopsis, the active ring in Gerbera is positioned on the periphery of the expression domain of the Clavata gene. We observed that in a Gerbera head, the size of the domain dramatically changes. It first expands as the head grows, and then it contracts. We then incorporated this dynamics into our model. Initially, the active ring coincides with the head rim, but then it moves inwards. As you can see, a spiral philotactic pattern then emerges. 
Parameters of this pattern correspond to those observed in real Gerbera heads. In particular, there are 55 and 34 parastiches near the rim. The number of parastiches decreases according to the reverse Fibonacci sequence towards the center. And near the center, the pattern becomes chaotic. We then investigated how robust is this pattern. The critical parameter is the rate of the propagation of the incipient primordia towards their older neighbors, as this is a parameter that controls the asymmetry of primordial position on the ring. We found out that we can reduce this parameter by one half or increase it twofold without fundamentally changing the pattern. Only more drastic changes, shown in the bottom row here, affect the parasitic numbers. Investigating the robustness further, we consider the fact that real heads, and in particular the active ring, often lack circular symmetry. Simulations showed that our model can generate correct pattern with Fibonacci parasitic numbers, in this case as well. Finally, we verified whether our proposed mechanism operates plausibly on a receptacle that resembles the actual shape of the head. To this end, we scanned heads at different stages of development using MicroCT and we created their longitudinal sections. We then traced the contours of these sections to obtain a sequence of head profiles as they occur in the course of head development. We have also tracked the position of the active ring, as shown here, as a red curve. We then interpolated these profiles to obtain a data-driven dynamic model of a growing receptacle. You can see here how the shape and size of the receptacle changes as it grows. The bottom panel shows the progression through a family of bisprine weights with which consecutive contours are mixed during the interpolation. We then applied our patterning mechanism to simulate the phyllotaxis on the growing receptacle. Once again, a pattern quantitatively matching the real heads is emerging. To further validate the model, we compared it to real heads seen from the bottom. As you can see, the distances of primordia from the stem increase exactly in the same way in the simulated head and in the real head. As visual comparisons of patterns are often useful, we improved our model by incorporating into it realistic shapes of individual florets. So, this is the model again. And this is the SEM of the actual head. To summarize, I presented a plausible model of phyllotaxis in Gerbera heads. Quite likely, it applies to other heads as well. According to our model, the main factors governing phyllotaxis in hands are the growth of the head, the dynamics of the active ring, and of course, the lateral displacement of primordia towards their older neighbors. Many interesting problems are still open. In particular, we don't know yet how the lateral propagation is affected at the molecular level. The interaction between auxin and its transporters, in particular PIN1 proteins, 
probably plays a major role and we look forward to having transgenic Gerbera plants with a PIN1 reporter. There are also interesting theoretical problems. Many existing notions used to characterize phyllotaxis, for example the plastochron and the divergence angle, only apply to arrhythmic production of primordia by a rotationally symmetric meristem. They need to be extended to asymmetric heads in which primordia are produced in bursts. Many people have contributed to this research. In particular, Paula Eloma's student Teng Zhang obtains experimental results, and Mick Cieślak and Andrew Owens developed most models. And everybody participated in imaging. Last but not least, big thanks go to the organizations that supported this research. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your comments and questions during the question period. Well, I hope it went smoothly. And again, thank you very much, uh, Emilio, uh, for, for the opportunity of presenting these results. Yeah, no problem. Let's wait uh, a little bit for the audience to make the first question. In the meanwhile, I would like to ask, um, what do you think about uh, variation at the size of the initial head? If, if size variation in these initial stages could have potential effects in the philotactic patterns? So, um, it is a very good question. And in the case of, our, of, our, of Gerbera, um, maybe because we uh, were considering cultivated Gerbera in controlled situation, it was very typical to have pattern with the same numbers of parastichis, um, 34 and 55. But looking at the, uh, well, um, Asterase heads in general, some have clearly larger numbers of uh, parastichis. Well, the extreme example is sunflower, where up to 144 um, parastichis have been reported. And some, uh, some have much less. Um, an, an example in the last, uh, latter category is Macrocelis pygmea, which was also analyzed from the viewpoint of, of phyrotaxis. So we believe that the larger the number of parastichis, the more this mechanism which we presented uh, which I presented, if, um, which is based on the uh, development of a pattern on the rim and includes this lateral displacement. So the mechanism is particularly important in the case of heads, which a large number of uh, parastichis. So Gerbera is an example, but probably also uh, the sunflower. And on the other hand, if we have an organism which with a smaller head and smaller number of parastichis, this can be if explained using uh, similar theories to those uh, advanced for Arabidopsis, which do not require um, lateral displacement and, and, if, and develop anyways. So this is a key question which is addressed here and, and is depend and is related to your question in the sense that the bigger the head in comparison with the size of primordia, the more important these mechanisms are is so the, the point is that well in, in this case the, the fact that the patterning occurs from outside in, in becomes more and more inexplicable if as well outside of the, the solution which we provided which shows that if, prim if primordia are um, displaced laterally then the, their, their number increases according to Fibonacci numbers, and then this provides sort of a seed or template for the further patterning. So it was a long answer to your, to your question, but I hope that, uh, that if, well, it, it addresses uh, the point that, yes, this pattern is qualitatively related to the uh, size of the head, but it is more the number of parastichis rather than the general character of this pattern 
that if that um, that is conditional upon this upon the size mm -hmm. okay we have a question from maria hilda flores he's wondering um, if there are more similar patterns in individual uh, vertex like the uh, calyx or the corolla <laughs> Thank you for the question. It is again a very good one. So um, we think that if um, the question of phyllotaxis is is um, in, in flowers is it was a good question, in particular in the case of such plants which have many organs uh, in the flowers. So in particular, at present we are looking at a strawberry and the number of which have large number of carpels. And we wonder whether we can explain uh, the phyllotaxis in strawberry in a similar fashion. Um, so we think that there is there is a similarity there between uh, the uh, placement of individual uh, florets in the head and the placement of individual or organs within flower within individual flowers. And and this probably is particularly interesting in the case of flowers which, like strawberry or, mag or magnolia, have many organs of the same type, which have to be distributed somehow. So <laughs> here is my answer. OK. Um, Jorge Nieto uh, is asking, are you incorporating in your model the notion that Outsin act as, an, as inductors of flower primordia and inhibitors of flower development? And a following up question is maybe add in your model auxin oxidation as trigger of flower development. Mm. Thank you. So, um, so that, that took to, to, to uh, well, three parts of the question. Um, the first one whether it is if whether it is uh, auxin plays a role of well promoting uh, promoting um, the development of of flowers definitely. We we uh, will assume that it is the case by uh, by um, following the what is known about what, about um, Arabidopsis, and as as a matter of fact, this was guiding this was uh, our motivation for seeking a genetic uh, transformation of uh, Gerbera so that we could have DR5 um, and uh, 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 DR5. GFP reporter, so that we could see where auxin is. We are only interested uh, in auxin because we assumed that it is auxin which uh, patterns where the uh, primordial eventually will be. Second thing is whether we believe that that well auxin is if will play an inhibitory role. And again, if um, by analogy with with uh, Arabidopsis. It is most likely the case that the entire pattern is that lots of patterning has to do with the distribution of auxin. As a matter of fact, we are uh, well trying to get um, to, to construct uh, to, to obtain another construct in which pin one would be uh, fused with GFP, and we could uh, see where exactly well in space and over time in space and over time are located uh, pin proteins and how. Oxen is transported if um, in the process of patterning. So this would be analog analogous to the if, um, an analogous direction of research to that we had in the case of Arabidopsis, where we ab were able to reconstruct phyllotaxis of Arabidopsis at the level of of uh, oxen and pin protein uh, interaction. So we think that this similar process taking place in Gerbera. But at this point, we don't have yet this uh, pin one GFP construct in Gerbera. So we are trying to get it, and we hope that it will succeed soon. And the last question, if whether um, if oxygen oxidation we could trigger flower development. I, unfortunately, I don't have any uh, thoughts uh, well um, about this. We just assumed that once well, um, patterning occurs, then sort of this, the, the, the fact alone that there is 
a high concentration of oxen in some particular location if, will suffice to trigger the development and then it proceeds, proceeds uh, through its own course. Of course, there is question, what the sites, what the sites, what type of flower uh, will there be at which location because Gerbera has three types of florets, um, disc florets, trans florets and uh, ray florets. Um, and if we looked in the, uh, well, we related this to the example of individual flowers, like in strawberry, for example, then the question is what determines which oxygen maximum results in what type of, of organ. Um, but if this is a very interesting question, but uh, well, um, in the scope of this research, we, did, we have not addressed it. So to summarize my answer to the question number three, I don't know. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, Ulises Rosas is asking, is auxin the cause or the byproduct? Are there known gene activities controlling the Fibonacci patterns, suspect mutants? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for the question. So, um, we, 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 if, um, we think that, that uh, auxin has informative role. It is not a byproduct but actually that it um, is, is if, well, that it is a step leading, well, uh, through, through events happening downstream uh, to, uh, to, um, to the patterning of individual primordia. Um, regarding genes, so consequently, we think that it is not so much uh, gene activities controlling the, the Fibonacci pattern directly, but those are if, um, different genes which control if, if which control the distribution of auxin, and in particular, if there is this question of uh, um, auxin transporters such as uh, pin proteins, and it is known, and it's actually this is how pins were uh, discovered that if you have pin mutant, then there are going to be no flowers in Arabidopsis at least. So. So we think that yes, there are genes which are controlling, which are affecting phylotaxis, but they are not acting directly. They are uh, well acting by uh, affecting the the patterning process, which is um, well at least in the case of inflorescences, very much dependent on the interaction of of auxin, auxin and its uh, transporters, and in particular. It's um, oxygen exporter pin one. Also, Ulysses is asking, you mentioned about Clavata three expression changing during development of a flower head. What about this counterpart, Wuschel? Yes, so, so um, collectively we, but definitely, at least, at least myself, we didn't uh, look as carefully as, as at Wuschel. But we we uh, expect that there is similar interaction between between Clavata and Bushel in if in the heads as it is in the case of um, as it is it is, it is it's, uh, in the case of Arabidopsis, which very much affects, when, for example, the overall size of the meristem. Okay. Um, there are no more questions. I have another one. I'm I'm wondering. You're proposing this lateral displacement mechanism uh, in the in the head of the herbera, but I'm wondering if this same mechanism could act in uh, leaf development phylotactic patterns. So, so th thank you very much for this question. It is it is um, well an excellent one. So the question is um, here. Actually, well, I, I could I could really well um, talk for quite a long time, <laughs> but I will try to to, to, to kind of first distill uh, well uh, my my answer to uh, to the essence. So, from a modeling perspective, we first observed um, that oxygen maxima may, may travel between cells when uh, trying to develop a model of uh, serration patterning in Arabidopsis leaves. 
So this was a, a collaborative work which I conducted with uh, Professor Milton Siantis, then uh, at Oxford and now at uh, MPI in Germany. Um, so if we, we, we simulated the interaction between pins and oxen on the growing uh, margin leaf, and we, we postulated, and actually this was, this was something which was an emergent phenomenon, that the new maxima were emerging if, if between well, previously formed ones as the leaf grew and there was more and more space on the margin. But we also observed that these maxima tend to jump so that kind of rather than staying where exactly where they were, then, then they would move a little bit to make more room for the next uh, maximum. This was a phenomenon which uh, well, um, was not observed in the leaves of, um, uh, of Arabidopsis. And we in, in particular attributed its absence to the action of another gene, a uh, CAC or a uh, CAC shaped cotyledons. And we developed a model in which, uh, which involved, which we described patterning in the um, in the margin of Arabidopsis leaves by interaction between oxen and pin and also CAC. And in this model, CAC had a stabilizing role. It prevented uh, this maxima once formed to travel along the margin. However, if uh, we knew from the simulations that, well, without this kind of extra protection, Oxen has a very, very much a tendency to travel. So, from this perspective, it was not a surprise when we not, when we observe this uh, traveling maxima in in, uh, in in Gerbera heads. And incidentally, if um, recently it has been also report, well, there has been uh, also a report of observations of traveling maxima in Arabidopsis. But in Arabidopsis, they appear to just travel in, ra in radial direction, kind of from the center outwards. While in, in the case of Gerbera, definitely there is this lateral co component. So we could ask why it is so in Gerbera and not, not so in Arabidopsis. And we attribute this to a very different dynamics of the, uh, of the growth of the meristem. In Arabidopsis, basically the meristem is maintaining its shape while producing primordia. Primordia sort of like flow downwards with respect to the um, peripheral zone and, and things are just being added. But in, 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 uh, in heads, in particular in Gebera head, we have this dramatic increase in the size of the meristem as it becomes a, well, a receptacle and the formation of if, and and the um, consequently the active zone, which is on the periphery and kind of counterpart of the peripheral zone in Arabidopsis, expands very rapidly, and this creates the conditions in which this lateral displacement may occur. So our kind of far-reaching guess is that actually the mechanism which we observe in Gerbera is quite universal, except that it only manifests itself in the conditions where there is a rapid uh, growth and there is no impediment by cack like in, in the uh, leaves of Arabidopsis. Um, so, so this is, this is, this is the, the kind of, to summarize, according to the modeling, is this interaction between oxen and pins is a very natural phenomenon. It can happen in, uh, well, very easily. And with, in some cases, it may be actually prevented by some uh, particular gene interactions and in some other cases, it doesn't happen because of growth dynamics. But in Gerbera, it is kind of flourishing because of the uh, growth dynamics. OK, nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, someone else, if uh, want to ask something. Um, also related with the phyllotaxis in leaves, uh, because there is work about how natural selection could favor some philotactic patterns to maximize capture, light capture. Um, so in that sense, uh, what could happen in, in, in the development of flowers or organ arrangement in flowers? What's 
the main natural selection uh, uh, forces in these patterns observed in sexual organs. What do you think about that? Yes. So, so um, the question of optimality of phylotaxis has appeared in literature many, many times. And in the case of heads, it seems indeed that, uh, that the well packing and density of packing is, is uh, what nature is after. However, if um, I think that, that, that if the key issue, the key reason why we observe this, this kind of patterns, well, including this apparently magic Fibonacci numbers in, in philotaxis, is not so much well adaptive but it is because it is something which for a plant is very easy to do. And this comes back to the uh, Hofmeister's uh, idea, well, where to produce uh, well and, and snow and snows, where should new uh, primordia be formed? Well, just where there's enough space. So if you have a ring and you just put things well, uh, where uh, and where is enough space, then then you wind up with, uh, with well, dense packing. Now, in the case of, of uh, Arabidopsis, where this expansion of the ring is slow, actually you don't need anything else. You just keep doing the same thing and emergently you will obtain the patterns um, as observed. In the case of, of heads, there's this additional uh, lateral displacement, which, which um, plays a role, but maybe actually evolutionarily very old um, kind of feature which just manifests itself uh, there, we don't know. If, but um, if, but it doesn't seem that 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 it is a, well a kind of very much a, well selective pressure, well acting on this as as uh, manifested by the thing that we have very happily if well um, existing well patterns which uh, plants which have the cassette patterns in the case of leaves, um, or even the stichus, which actually should appear as quite unoptimal from the point of gathering light because one leaf is above another and that then they still very nicely exist. So if um, so um, it, it does not appear that, that it is, is when well, this particular golden angle uh, well, um, particularly involved in, in, in the selective uh, process. It, it, is, it is there because it is something which, which for, for a plant is very easy to do. Okay. Even though mathematically it's not necessarily so easy to analyze. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um. Hey, Emilio, I have a question, but I don't have it very well formulated. But, uh, you know, when I was listening to the, to the talk from Professor Prosinkiewicz, I was thinking of cacti all the time. I'm, I'm working with cacti now. Um, in cacti, we have, I mean, some of the largest um, meristems known in, in plants. For instance, there is a barrel plant that is about uh, one meter, two meters wide. It's called Echinocactus platecanthus. So actually, Emilio also worked on it. And it's called one of the largest meristems. And uh, it's about, if I remember well, Emilio, it's about 2,000 microns, 2,500 microns, the, the meristem. And it always came to my mind that why, I mean, what, what you were asking, uh, why the meristem is so large? I mean, if, if there is space for making uh, axillary meristems, why the plant doesn't make them, right? Why it keeps such a large meristem, which is, which is maybe not the clever, the most clever thing to do when you are exposed in a desert with a lot of light coming in and so on. But anyway, regardless of that, uh, you have a wide meristem, you have five Fibonacci series of uh, axillary meristems. And, and actually, those meristems are often not fully circular, but a little bit oval. They are a little bit not fully circular. But the most interesting thing, not necessarily with the Chinocactus, well, yeah, but maybe in, in some of these plants, is that there are natural mutants that I always thought to be mutants of Clavata tree or, or Busher. So I don't have my question very well formulated. I just have a comment. <laughs> I don't know if you wanna do you wanna add out on this, Professor. Yes. You made you made my day. 
And this is because actually, um, well, sort of like prompted by by if, um, what happens in, in Gerbera, we uh, we if, in a particular uh, by seeing that it doesn't that meristem doesn't have to be uh, radially symmetric, and even if it is not, you may still have Bonacci numbers, also not always. We started looking at this uh, well, uh, at, at different cases, uh, which are like that. And uh, well, um, in, as, as a matter of fact, we, we so we have some kind of um, SEMs of situations where 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 things are deformed, and and some heads. Well, sometimes it's just uh, well, uh, accidental situation, whereas the head happens to be very elliptic, and and well, we we put picture, pictures of this. But we are also working on mutants, which would have a, a, which would have a, a heads which are a, quite deformed, and and we a, and we try to find out what would be the situation there. So, actually, we believe that that the situation you mentioned, if if the situation in which paternic will occurs, but in a situation which is not radially symmetric. And maybe elliptic, maybe even farther from 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 an ellipse, is is something which has been grossly overlooked. So when you said that that well, you have many examples of of cacti, uh, which are like this, then um, then there's, there's something which um, if immediately well if, um, rose my interest and actually my feeling is is yes, this is exactly what what deserves to be looked at. And actually, well, I would, I would, if you have some pictures, I would love to see them in, in, in more detail and maybe s uh, try to simulate them. So there are also situations in, in, in some cacti which have very flat leaves. So, so and yet they have phylotactic patterns which well, cannot be described in terms of divergence angle and so on, but still are very regular. So over there, I don't know whether these kind of situations uh, are occurring secondarily or whether they've or, or, or not. So by secondary, I mean that the meristem would be circular, more or less, and then flattening will appear on let, later. But maybe it's not like this. Maybe it's so that from the beginning, we are dealing with a structure which is quite, well, non-circular, non and yet plastic patterning takes place there. So, so, so if I may ask you a question, which is the case if you have, if you have very flattened uh, well, stems, are they, are they Platonic secondarily, or are they generated from the beginning as as, uh, as platen, and the little spikes which occur occur on them are being generated in a, in a circularly non-symmetric situation? I think that's a, the case of this very particular group of cacti that are called the opuntia opuntioide clade. That um, from very early in development. Uh, to be honest, I think that's a puzzle. That's a puzzle whether why these plants grow flattened, because it's not clear whether, I mean, some people say, some specialists say that it's a flattened stem, therefore it's not equivalent to a leaf, or it's in a way functionally equivalent to a leaf. But it's not functionally equivalent to a leaf anatomically either, because it doesn't have the adaxial and the abaxial side. Um, do you know if it emerges, uh, how the, the, the flattening emerges, uh, Emilio? If it emerges very early in development or? I don't know. I'm not sure. So, so the interesting thing about this is that not all the, the plants from this uh, clay are fully flattened. So there are other sort of uh, sister species or some other species that are called cylindropuntias, which are actually a cylinder. So, so you know, probably during the evolution, it's either that the flattening arose as a as a uh, as a novelty or cylinder-like um, stems also arose as a novelty later on. So I don't know. That's that's the that's the short answer. <laughs> okay. I would, I would be very interested to hearing. Well, well, if if uh, well, what would be your thought if, if you happen to 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 run on this question and, and know the answer? Um, we, are, we are like this is something which actually with in collaboration with with my my uh, Helsinki collaborators we've been thinking about addressing next. Well, actually, we have here in the Institute Institute of Biology we have a 
some of the experts on cacti, cacti biology. So we have uh, Dr. Salvador Arias, who is the curator of our collection. And also we have the former advisor of Emilio, uh, Dr. Teresa Terrazas, who is the specialist on cacti anatomy. So they, they are the persons who, so who will know these, these questions, uh, the answers with precision. Very interesting. Thank you very much for, for pointing out. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think we hope we don't have more questions in the chat. Mm. Okay. Okay, so do you want to give any closing remarks, uh, Professor or Emilio? Well, on my side, I would like to very much uh, thank again uh, Emilio and yourself for this opportunity to 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 to, to share my results with uh, with with you and with, with with audience. I'm so sad that I cannot see well um, your faces and and we cannot have more direct interaction. Um, I hope that you enjoyed uh, these results in spite in spite of of well subdued discussion. And yeah, thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Prisikiewicz. It was a very nice talk. Also, in the chat, we have some, uh, they are saying you that thank you for the talk, that it was very nice. So, yes, I think, Ulysses, I, I give you the word. OK. Well, again, once again, thank you to Emilio for inviting Professor uh, Prisikiewicz. And, and thanks a lot. Uh, Professor Proshinkevich for the excellent talk, uh, top science, and, and we hope that we get to hear more about your science later on in the future, hopefully in Mexico. And now uh, I'm just going to close the session, uh, so I'm going to switch into Spanish. Eh, muchas gracias a toda la audiencia que nos sintonizó en tiempo real y a la audiencia que nos vio en otro momento. Eh, los invitamos a que se suscriban a nuestro canal de seminarios del Instituto de Biología para que reciban las notificaciones de nuestros próximos seminarios institucionales, los cuales se llevan a cabo cada martes a las 11 de la mañana. Quiero recordarles que el próximo seminario será impartido por la profesora Rebeca Safran dentro de la serie inaugural de los seminarios de frontera en sistemática, biodiversidad y evolución. De manera excepcional, este seminario será el lunes a las 11 de la mañana, es el lunes a las 11 de la mañana, en lugar de los martes habituales que tenemos. Con esto nos despedimos de ustedes eh, y nos, nos sintonizamos la próxima semana. Muchas gracias. Thanks a lot, Professor Prusinkevich. Thanks a lot, eh, Emilio Petroni. Bye bye. Bye bye.